we have come round to that time of year again. We find ourselves at this cluster of holidays that celebrates those who have died and left us with their legacy. All Souls Day, El Dia de los Muertos, Fet Gede, and Samhain, diverse expressions of the common theme of loss and hope, memory and celebration. We need this. We need to be able to remember, to grieve, and to celebrate. It is one of the most vulnerable, honest, and human parts of the year that we recognize with one another. While this impulse to memory exists in many cultures, it has become something of a forgotten thing to most Americans. The American version of Halloween is wonderful and whimsical with its grand parade of ghouls, goblins, and ghosts that we saw a couple of weeks ago with our uh, kids here in the service. But it is also a holiday that's noteworthy for putting away all signs of loss and remembrance, unlike that same tradition in other parts of the world. We are a unique culture and that we lack a common time to recognize the dead. I think this stems in part from the American discomfort with grief. Perhaps we think that grief and mourning are messy things, that they conflict with the pursuit of happiness, and so they are put to the side. It's a countercultural thing to claim this space, to say that remembering in community is important. We remember whether we want to or not, whether our culture says it is okay or not. Many years after I lost my spouse, I spoke with a colleague who had gone through a similar situation. We sat on a modest wooden bench looking out over a valley. As the valley dipped far below us, the tops of redwoods bowed in the wind. The scent of pine needles permeated the air, and leaves from great oaks lazily twirled on their way to the autumn earth. That day, my colleague told me something that has stuck with me. She said, you know, you can never go back. You've been given a passport to that dark land of grief. You can travel to other places, but grief will to you always be a familiar territory. We sat in silence with those words singeing the air, letting their truth settle in. To remember is, in part, to grieve. It is to recognize the painful loss of a person who was once physically tangible to us. The loss can feel like an overwhelming hollowness, a pain that we can never fully comprehend or domesticate. The poet Rashani calls it a hollow space that is too deep for words in a cry deeper than all sound whose serrated edges cut the heart. But through this grief, through this experience that pushes us to the edge of experience, we often find something deeper and truer about ourselves. We discover, again to use the words of the poet Rashani, the place inside which is unbreakable and whole while learning to sing. That hollow space of grief has a strange economy to it. In a screenplay written by the author Cormac McCarthy, um, The Counselor contains a fascinating monologue about grief. There, a character talks about a poet who lost his wife. That poet only became a great poet after she died, he said. And yet, that poet would have traded all of his poems for just another hour with his beloved. The character in the movie then said, and I paraphrase here, grief has its own strange economy. 
It transcends value because we would trade the object of our grief for everything that has value in our lives. And yet grief itself is worthless. It has no value. It cannot be traded for anything, and no one would want it. All we can do, in his view, is sit with it, name it, experience it. Now, what I believe the screenplay and the film The Counselor is missing in this account is that there is also healing in the midst of grief. Grief never goes away completely, but there is some strange alchemy in it. Its edges become softer, and its deepest cuts begin to heal. Eventually, you are able to move forward and hopefully to experience joy once again. Grief may become this place that you visit, a familiar territory, but not one that you have to live in all of the time. The human spirit is more resilient than we often give it credit for. It is able to hold on to the double experience of remembering and healing, grieving and moving forward all at once. We are given a passport to that dark land, and yet we are not obliged to use the passport all of the time. My good news today is that there is healing here. I was thinking about this a lot in preparation for this sermon Once we are given a passport to the land of grief, what is it that lures us back to the land of the living, I've been wondering about. And what came to me is a concept from the Unitarian theologian James Luther Adams. He writes about our being a part of a larger reality that lures us towards the good. He calls it the creative, sustaining, transforming reality in which our lives are caught up. Healing from loss, I think, is an example of his concept in practice. When we begin to heal from grief, an inner resilience develops that pulls us through our loss. But what is the source of that inner resilience, we might ask? Part of it comes from within, certainly, from our past experience with loss and how those losses began to heal with time. Part of it also comes from others, their gestures of kindness, their stories of healing, their hope for our lives. Part of it comes from our family and then also our friends and our cultural history. We have stories about familiar figures who have lived and loved after loss, religious approaches that gesture towards renewal after death, and volumes of poetry and literature that offer hope in this respect. And then there is an even larger context of resilience in which we find our lives situated. The world has a mysterious way of recovering from incredible devastation. We might think of life that has begun to grow in nuclear dead zones years before we might have expected it to do so. Or we might think simply of the leaves that come back to the trees after a long and cold winter. A sprout bursts through thawing ground. The world gently offers itself up to us as a metaphor for our grief and its healing a gift that we didn't ask for, but are given nonetheless. Now, John Donne famously wrote, No man is an island unto himself. We discover ourselves in a larger context in which the spirit of healing and transformation offers itself. In my deepest times of grief, I found this to be good news because I did not feel that the task of resilience was mine alone. I was able to trust that eventually healing might be possible even if it was not immediate. Healing might be possible even if it was not immediate. Maybe that's what faith is. 
trusting that some spirit of transformation might move through my heart, through my interactions with others, through my world, and slowly make a difference. That the passport to grief would become a passport and not a permanent citizenship. Indeed, there is strange alchemy here. What once felt like an unbearable sadness, an aching loss, slowly begins to recede. The goodbye aches a little bit less. Healing and transformation take place in our hearts slowly in the hours of our unknowing. Where one day there was nothing but grief, the next month or year, joy and gratitude begin to flower in their place. We come to a place where the bitterness of an end is replaced with thanks that such a person lived and was a part of our lives. We might not know exactly when night becomes day or winter turns into spring, but there is nonetheless some inner change that has taken place here. It is as apparent as a seed that sprouts from thawing ground. May that spirit of healing move among us on this day, in this hour, in this place, and also in all of our days to come. Amen. I love you, and blessed be.